Chapter 4, Part 1 of the Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter 4 In Cowboy Land. Part 1. Though I had previously made a trip into the then territory of Dakota, beyond the Red River, it was not until 1883 that I went to the Little Missouri, and there took hold of two cattle ranches, the Chimney Butte and the Elkhorn. It was still the Wild West in those days, the Far West, the West of Owen Wister's stories and Frederick Remington's drawings, the West of the Indian and the Buffalo Hunter, the Soldier and the Cowpuncher, that land of the West has gone now, gone, gone with lost Atlantis, gone to the Isle of Ghosts and of strange dead memories. It was a land of vast silent spaces, of lonely rivers and of plains where the wild game stared at the passing horsemen. It was a land of scattered ranches, of herds of longhorn cattle, and of reckless riders who, unmoved, looked into the eyes of life or of death. In that land we led a free and hardy life, with horse and with rifle. We worked under the scorching midsummer sun, when the wide plains shimmered and wavered in the heat, and we knew the freezing misery of riding night guard round the cattle in the late fall roundup. In the soft springtime the stars were glorious in our eyes each night before we fell asleep, and in the winter we rode through blinding blizzards, when the driver snow dust burned our face. There were monotonous days, as we guided the trail cradle, or the beef herds, hour after hour at the slowest of walks, and minutes or hours teeming with excitement, as we stopped stampedes, or swam the herds across rivers, treacherous with quicksands, or brimmed with running ice. We knew toil and hardship, and hunger and thirst, and we saw men die violent deaths as they worked among horses and cattle, or fought in evil feuds with one another. But we felt the beat of hearty life in our veins, and ours was the glory of work and the joy of living. It was right and necessary that this life should pass, for the safety of our country lies in being made the country of the small homemaker. The great unfenced ranches and the days of free grass necessarily represented a temporary stage in our history. The large migratory flocks of sheep, each guarded by the hired shepherds of absentee owners, were the first enemies of the cattlemen, and owing to the way they ate out the grass and destroyed all other vegetation, these roving sheep bands represented little of permanent good to the country. But the homesteaders, the permanent settlers, the men who took up each his own farm on which he lived and brought up his family, these represented, from the national standpoint, the most desirable of all possible users of and dwellers on the soil. Their advent meant the breaking up of the big ranches, and the change was a national gain, although to some of us an individual loss. I first reached the Little Missouri on a northern Pacific train about three in the morning on a cool September day in 1883. Aside from the station, the only building was a ramshackle structure called the Pyramid Park Hotel. I dragged my duffel bag thither and hammered at the door until the drowsy proprietor appeared, muttering oaths. He ushered me upstairs, where I was given one of the fourteen beds in the room which by itself constituted the entire upper floor. Next day I walked over to the abandoned army post, and after some hours among the gray log shacks, a ranchman who had driven into the station agreed to take me out to his ranch, the Chimney Butte Ranch, where he was living with his brother and their partner. The ranch was a log structure with a dirt roof, a corral for the horses nearby, and a chicken house jabbed against the rear of the ranch house. Inside, there was only one room, with a table, three or four chairs, a cooking stove, and three bunks. The owners were Sylvain and Joe Ferris, and William J. Merrifield. Later, all three of them held my commissions while I was president. Merrifield was Marshal of Montana and, as presidential elector, cast the vote of that state for me in 1904. Sylvain Ferris was the land officer in North Dakota, and Joe Ferris postmaster at Medora. There was a fourth man, Joe Meyer, who also worked for me later, 
That evening we all played Old Sledge round the table, and at one period the game was interrupted by a frightful squawking outside which told us that a bobcat had made a raid on the chicken house. After a buffalo hunt with my original friend Joe Ferris, I entered into partnership with Merrifield and Sylvain Ferris, and we started a cow ranch with the Maltese Cross brand, always known as Maltee Cross, by the way, as the general impression along the Little Missouri was that Maltese must be a plural. Twenty-nine years later, my four friends of that night were delegates to the first progressive national convention at Chicago. They were among my most constant companions for the few years next, succeeding the evening when the bobcat interrupted the game of Old Sledge. I lived and worked with them on the ranch, and with them, and many others like them, on the roundup, and I brought out from Maine, in order to start the Elkhorn Ranch lower down the river, my two backwoods friends, Sewell and Dow. My brands for the lower ranch were the Elkhorn and the Triangle. I do not believe there was any more life attractive to a vigorous young fellow than life on a cattle ranch in those days. It was a fine, healthy life, too. It taught a man self-reliance, hardihood, and the value of instant decision. In short, the virtues that ought to come from life in the open country. I enjoyed the life to the full. After the first year, I built on the Elkhorn Ranch a long, low ranch house of hewn logs with a veranda and with, in addition to the other rooms, a bedroom for myself and a sitting room with a big fireplace. I got out a rocking chair, I am very fond of rocking chairs, and enough books to fill two or three shelves, and a rubber bathtub so I could get a bath. And then I do not see how anyone could have lived more comfortably. We had buffalo robes and bearskins of our own killing. We always kept the house clean, using the word in a rather large sense. There were at least two rooms that were always warm, even in the bitterest weather, and we had plenty to eat. Commonly, the mainstay of every meal was game of our own killing, usually antelope or deer, sometimes grouse or ducks, and occasionally, in the earlier days, buffalo or elk. We also had flour and bacon, sugar, salt, and canned tomatoes. And later, when some of the men married and brought out their wives, we had all kinds of good things, such as jams and jellies made from the wild plums and the buffalo berries, and potatoes from the forlorn little garden patch. Moreover, we had milk. Most ranchmen at that time never had milk. I knew more than one ranch with 10,000 head of cattle, and there was not a cow that could be milked. We made up our minds that we would be more enterprising. Accordingly, we started to domesticate some of the cows. Our first efforts were not successful, chiefly because we could not devote the needed time and patience to the matter. And we found that to race a cow two miles at full speed on horseback, then rope her, throw her, and turn her upside down to milk her, while exhilarating as a pastime, was not productive of results. Gradually, we accumulated tame cows, and after we had thinned out the bobcats and coyotes, more chickens. The ranch house stood on the brink of a low bluff, overlooking the broad, shallow bed of the Little Missouri, through which at most seasons there ran only a trickle of water, while at times of freshet it was filled brimful with a boiling, foaming, muddy torrent. There was no neighbor for ten or fifteen miles on either side of me. The river twisted down in long curves between narrow bottoms bordered by sheer cliff walls. For the badlands, a chaos of peaks, plateaus, and ridges rose abruptly from the edges of the level, tree-clad, or grassy alluvial meadows. In front of the ranch house veranda was a row of cottonwood trees, with gray-green leaves which quivered all day long if there was a breath of air. From these trees came the far-away, melancholy cooing in, of morning doves, and little owls perched in them and called tremulously at night. In the long summer afternoons we would sometimes sit on the piazza when there was no work to be done, and for an hour or two at a time, watching the cattle on the sandbars and the sharply channeled and strangely carved amphitheater of cliffs across the bottom opposite, while the vultures wheeled overhead their black shadows gliding across the glaring white of the dry riverbed. Sometimes from the ranch we saw deer, and once when we needed meat I shot one across the river as I stood on the piazza. In the winter, in the days of iron cold, when everything was white under the snow, the river lay in its bed fixed and immovable as a bar of bent steel, and then at night wolves and lynxes traveled up and down it as if it had been a highway passing in front of the ranch house. 
Often, in the late fall or early winter, after a hard day's hunting, or when returning from one of the winter line camps, we did not reach the ranch until hours after sunset, and after the first weary tramping in the cold, it was a keen pleasure to catch the first red gleam of the firelit windows across the snowy wastes. The Elkhorn Ranch House was built mainly by Sewell and Dow, who, like most men from the Maine woods, were mighty with the axe. I could chop fairly well for an amateur, but I could not do one-third of the work they could. One day, when we were cutting down the cottonwood trees to begin our building operations, I heard someone ask Dow what the total cut had been, and Dow, not realizing that I was within hearing, answered, Well, Bill cut down 53, I cut down 49, and the boss, he beavered down 17. Those who have seen the stump of a tree which has been gnawed down by a beaver will understand the exact force of the comparison. In those days, on a cow ranch, the men were apt to be away on the various roundups at least half the time. It was interesting and exciting work, and except for the lack of sleep on the spring and summer roundups, it was not exhausting work, compared to lumbering or mining or blacksmithing. To sit in the saddle is an easy form of labor. The ponies were, of course, grass-fed and unshod. Each man had his own string of nine or ten. One pony would be used for the morning work, one for the afternoon, and neither would be used for the next three days. A separate pony was kept for night riding. The spring and early summer roundups were especially for the branding of calves. There was much hard work and some risk on the roundup, but also much fun. The meeting place was appointed weeks beforehand, and all the ranchmen of the territory to be covered by the roundup sent their representatives. There were no fences in the West that I knew, and their place was taken by the cowboy and the branding iron. The cattle wandered free. Each calf was branded with the brand of the cow it was following. Sometimes in winter, there was what we call line riding. That is, camps were established and the line riders traveled a definite beat across the desolate wastes of snow, to and fro from one camp to another, to prevent the cattle from drifting. But as a rule, nothing was done to keep the cattle in any one place. In the spring, there was a general roundup in each locality. Each outfit took part in its own roundup, and all the outfits of a given region combined to send representatives to the two or three roundups that covered the neighborhoods nearby into which the cattle might drift. For example, our little Missouri roundup generally worked down the river for a distance some 50 or 60 miles above Mike Ranch toward the Kildeer Mountains, about the same distance below. In addition, we would usually send representatives to the Yellowstone roundup, and to the roundup along the upper Little Missouri, and moreover, if we heard that cattle had drifted, perhaps towards the Indian Reservation southeast of us, we would send a wagon and rider after them. In the meeting point, which might be in the valley of a half-dry stream, or in some broad pattern of the river itself, or perchance by a couple of ponds under which some queerly shaped butte was the landmark for the region round about, we would all gather on the appointed day. The chuck wagons, containing the bedding and food, each drawn by four horses and driven by the teamster cook, would come jolting and rattling over the uneven sward. Accompanying each wagon was eight or ten riders. The cowpunchers, while their horses, a band of a hundred or so, were driven by the two herders, one of whom was known as the day wrangler and the other as the night wrangler. The men were lean, sinewy fellows, accustomed to riding half-broken horses at any speed over any country, by day or by night. They wore flannel shirts with loose handkerchiefs knotted round their necks, broad hats, high-heeled boots with jingling spurs, and sometimes leather chaps, although often they merely had their trousers tucked into the tops of their high boots. There was a great deal of rough horseplay, and as with any gathering of men or boys of high animal spirits, the horseplay sometimes became very rough indeed, and as men usually carried revolvers, and as there were occasionally one or two noted gunfighters among them, there were now and then a shooting affray. A man who was a coward, or who shirked his work, had a bad time, of course. A man could not afford to let himself be bullied or treated as a butt. And, on the other hand, if he was looking for a fight, he was certain to find it. But my own experience was that, if a man did not talk until his associates knew him well and liked him, and if he did his work, he never had any difficulty in getting on. In my own roundup district, I speedily grew to be friends with most of the men. When I went among strangers, I always had to spend 24 hours in living down the fact that I wore spectacles, 
remaining as long as I could, judiciously deaf to any side remarks about four eyes, until it became evident that my being quiet was misconstrued, and that it was better to bring matters to a head at once. If, for instance, I was sent off to represent the little Missouri brands on some neighboring roundup, such as the Yellowstone, I usually showed that kind of diplomacy which consists in not uttering one word that can be avoided. I would probably have a couple of days' solitary ride, mounted on one horse, and driving eight or ten others before me, one of them carrying my bedding. Loose horses drive best at a trot or a canter, and if a man is traveling alone in this fashion, it is a good thing to have them reach the campground sufficiently late to make them desire to feed and sleep where they are until morning. In consequence, I never spent more than two days on the journey from whatever point it was which I left the little Missouri, sleeping the one night for as limited a number of hours as possible. As soon as I reached the meeting place, I would find out the wagon to which I was assigned. Riding to it, I turned my horses into the saddle band and reported to the wagon boss, or, in his absence, to the cook, always a privileged character, who was allowed and expected to order men around. He would usually grumble savagely and profanely about my having been put with his wagon, but this was merely conventional on his part, and if I sat down and said nothing, he would probably soon ask me if I wanted anything to eat, to which the correct answer was, I was not hungry and I would wait until meal time. The bedding rolls of the riders would be strewn round the grass, and I would put mine down a little outside the ring, where I would not be in anyone's way, with my six or eight branding irons beside it. The men would ride in, laughing and talking with one another, and perhaps nodding to me. One of their number, usually the wagon foreman, might put some questions to me as to which brands I represented, but no other word would be addressed to me, nor would I be expected to volunteer any conversation. Supper would consist of bacon, Dutch oven bread, and possibly beef. Once I won the good graces of my companions at the outset by appearing with two antelope which I had shot. After supper, I would roll up my bedding as soon as possible, and the others would follow suit at their pleasure. At three in the morning or thereabouts, at a yell from the cook, all hands would turn hurriedly out. Dressing was a simple affair. Then each man rolled and corded his bedding. If he did not, the cook would leave it behind, and he would go without any for the rest of the trip, and came to the fire, where he picked out a tin cup, tin plate, and knife and fork, and helped himself to coffee and whatever food there was, and ate it standing or squatted as best suited him. Dawn was probably breaking at this time, and the tramping of unshod hooves showed that the night wrangler was bringing in the pony herd. Two of the men would then run ropes from the wagon at right angles to one another, and into this, as a corral, the horses would be driven. Each man might rope one of his own horses, or more often point it out to the most skillful roper of the outfit, who would rope it for him. For if the man was an unskillful roper, and roped the wrong horse, or roped the horse in the wrong place, there was a whole chance of the whole herd stampeding. Each man then saddled and bridled his horse. This was usually followed by some resolute bucking on the part of two or three of the horses, especially in the early days of the roundup. The bucking was always a source of amusement to all the men whose horses did not buck, and these fortunate ones would gather round once giving ironical advice, and especially adjuring the rider not to go to leather, that is, not to steady himself in the saddle by catching hold of the saddle horn. As soon as the men had mounted, the whole outfit started on the long circle, the morning circle, Usually the ranch foreman who bossed a given wagon was put in charge of the men of one group by the round-up foreman. He might keep his men together until they had gone some 10 or 15 miles from camp and then drop them in couples at different points. Each couple made its way towards the wagon, gathering all the cattle it could find. The morning's ride might last six or eight hours, and it was still longer before some men got in. Singly and in twos and threes they appeared from every quarter on the horizon the dust rising from the hooves of the steers and bulls, the cows and calves they had collected. Two or three of the men were left to take care of the herd, while the others changed horses, ate a hasty dinner, and then came out to the afternoon work. This consisted of each man in succession being sent into the herd, usually with a companion, to cut out the cows of his brand or brands, which were followed by unbranded calves, and also to cut out any mavericks or unbranded yearlings. We worked each animal gently out to the edge of the herd, 
and then with a sudden dash took it off at a run. It was always desperately anxious to break back and rejoin the herd. There was much breakneck galloping and twisting and turning before its desire was thwarted, and it was driven out to join the rest of the cut, that is, the other animals which had been cut out, and were being held by one or two of the other men. Cattle hate being alone, and it was no easy matter to hold the first one or two that were cut out. But soon they got a little herd of their own, and then they were contented. When the cutting out had been all done, the calves were branded, and all misadventures of the calf wrestlers, the men who seized, threw, and held each calf when roped by the mounted roper, were hailed with yelling laughter. Then the animals, which, for one reason or another, it was desired to drive along with the roundup, were put into one herd and left in charge of a couple of night guards, and the rest of us would loaf back to the wagons for supper and bed. By this time, I would have been accepted as one of the rest of the outfit, and all strangeness would have passed off, and the attitude of my fellow cowpunchers being one of friendly forgiveness even towards my spectacles. Night guards for the cattle herd were then assigned by the captain of the wagon, or perhaps by the round-up foreman, according to the needs of the case, the guard standing for two hours at a time from eight in the evening till four in the morning. The first and last of the watches were preferable, because sleep was not broken, as in both of the other two. If things went well, the cattle would soon bed down, and nothing further would occur till morning, when there was a repetition of the work, the wagon moving each day eight or ten miles to some appointed camping place. Each man would picket his night horse near the wagon, usually choosing the quietest animal in his string for that purpose, because to saddle and mount a mean horse at night is not pleasant. When utterly tired, it was hard to have to get up for one's trick at the night herd. Nevertheless, on ordinary nights, the two hours round the cattle, in still darkness, were pleasant. The loneliness, under the vast empty sky, and the silence, in which the breathing of the cattle sounded loudly, and the alert readiness to meet any emergency might suddenly arise out of the formless night, all combined to give one a sense of subdued interest. Then one soon got to know the cattle of marked individuality, the ones that led the others into mischief, and one who also grew to recognize the traits they all possessed in common, and the impulses which, for instance, made a whole herd get up towards midnight, each beast turning round, then lying down again. By the end of the watch, each rider had studied the cattle until it grew monotonous, and hardly welcomed his relief guard. A newcomer, of course, had any amount to learn, and sometimes the simplest things were those which brought him to grief. One night, early in my career, I failed satisfactorily to identify the direction in which I was to go in order to reach the night herd. It was a pitch-dark night. I managed to get started wrong, and I never found either the herd or the wagon again until sunrise when I was greeted with withering scorn by the injured cowpuncher, who had been obliged to stand double guard because I failed to relieve him. There were other misadventures that I met with where the excuse was greater. The punchers on night guard usually rode toward the cattle in reverse directions, calling and singing to them if the beasts seemed restless to keep them quiet. On rare occasions, something happened that made the cattle stampede, and then the duty of the riders was to keep them as long as possible, and try gradually to get control of them. End of chapter 4, part 1